a good Sunday morning to you. Uh, we had some major technical difficulties. It seems that Facebook uh, didn't want to use my camera on my laptop this morning without me doing some major overhauling. Uh, I am not a techie at all, so uh, that's something I'm going to have to try to fix later on. I'm on my wife's phone right now. Don't call her. <laughs> uh, uh, she's. Uh, we tried uh, rebooting my laptop. We tried using her laptop. We, we're now on her phone, so uh, I guess third time's a charm. Uh, if you would open your Bible to Amos chapter 4. I want to study from Amos chapters 4 and 5 this morning as we look at the prophet's message to the apostate northern kingdom of Israel that they need to prepare to meet their God. And we're going to dig into these chapters. There's a lot of good information here that we need to learn about God and about our responsibility to God. So again, sorry for the delay. But uh, I'm glad you're with us. So many I see are, are, are on here. Uh, thankful for your patience. And uh, let's have our Bible open and we're going to dig into Amos. Now, uh, just a reminder, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock Eastern, uh, we'll continue our study of Philippians. We'll wrap up chapter 2, Philippians 2, verses 19 through 30, as the Apostle Paul talks about Timothy and Epaphroditus. But that's on Wednesday night. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll start our study this morning. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for this beautiful day that you've given us, and we're thankful we live during this time in which we have technology that allows us to connect with one another, uh, to study your word together, and to proclaim your gospel throughout the world. We pray that you would bless our nation uh, that you would be with those who are sick and suffering, with those who are recovering, with those who are in harm's way. We ask that you would forgive us of our sins and that you would bless our study of your word. In Jesus' name we humbly pray, amen. For those of you who aren't very familiar with the writings of the prophets, it's a, it is a, a large portion of the Old Testament scriptures and it's a very rich portion of God's word. There's a lot there. Amos was called upon to prophesy against the northern kingdom of Israel during the days of Jeroboam the second, or Jeroboam the son of Joash. Israel was enjoying a heyday of economic prosperity and national power, but it was really the silence before the storm. They were indifferent to their true spiritual condition before God. They were involved in idol worship. And that went all the way back to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, when, when the kingdom divided and the northern kingdom began. Uh, they also had fallen into political corruption and social injustice. The prophet Amos was called to leave Judah to go north to Israel to call them to repentance before God delivered them into Assyrian captivity. Amos is a favorite prophet among many preachers today because he doesn't pull any punches. He was not intimidated at all by those who tried to silence him he was faithful and he was bold in delivering a much needed but little appreciated message to God's people. The cup of God's wrath was full. Their judgment was coming. They needed to prepare to meet their God. Now, as we look at these two chapters, chapters 4 and 5, as I read through these chapters, there are some lessons that, that come to my mind. And I want to share these with you this morning. There are four lessons that I see from Amos uh, chapters 4 and 5. The first lesson that I see, this chapter tells us, reminds us, that God is faithful to always send a warning before he sends his judgment. God always sends a warning before he sends judgment and destruction. God's people, as you read through the Bible, you notice that God's people are often blinded to their true spiritual condition before God, which really is interesting because all they would have to do is go back and look at their history 
and they could see that lesson repeated over and over again. Just the book of Judges alone goes through the cycle of apostasy, oppression, and repentance, deliverance, over and over and over again. God had sent prophets to his people to warn them that destruction was coming. I want us to turn back to 2 Kings 17. Look at verses 13 and 14. Uh, this is something that's set forth here in, in 2 Kings 17, but, but it also shows up uh, in, in other places in the Old Testament as well. Uh, notice in verse 13, it says, Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all of his prophets, every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Nevertheless, they would not hear. Well, God was faithful in sending his warnings through his prophets. He sent them early, he says in the book of Jeremiah, but they would not listen. But here in our text in Amos chapter 4, there was another thing that God used to try to get their attention and try to get them to repent. And that was repeated calamities that they had to suffer. Look here in chapter 4 in verse 6. God says, I also gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and a lack of bread in all your places, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. He sent them famine. He sent them starvation. They suffered through that, but they didn't repent. Verses 7 and 8, there was drought. He withheld rain from them, yet they did not return to him. Verse 9, crop failure. I blasted you with blight and mildew when your gardens increased, your vineyards, your fig trees, and your olive trees. The locusts devoured them, yet you've not returned to me, says the Lord. Verse 10, I sent you a plague after the manner of Egypt. Your young men I killed with a sword along with your captive horses. I made the stench of your camps come up into your nostrils. There was devastation. There was war and death. And yet you've not returned to me, says the Lord. Verse 11, I overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were like a firebrand plucked from the burning. There was disaster that was sent upon you. And those of you who survived it were lucky to survive. You were like the firebrand brand that, that, was, that was plucked from the fire. You're lucky to be alive, and yet you've not returned to me. There's that refrain that's found all through this section. God had warned them. God had told them and they had not repented. They'd not come to him. God is patient, but God's patient knows an end. He will bring judgment when the cup of his wrath has filled. But here's the point. God never brings judgment and destruction without first bringing a warning and a call to repentance. That warning for them was the prophets, and those calamities that they underwent. The, the judgment day for us or, or the, the, the warning that comes for us is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31, when he was preaching in Athens, the apostle Paul says, Truly the times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. The evidence of that is that he has raised Jesus from the dead, Paul went on to say. The call to repent comes through the gospel. But just as Israel of old suffered these calamities... And God was using these calamities as wake-up calls to get them to repent. You and I suffer through calamities today. And the proper use we are to make of these, whether God causes them or God allows them to happen, I don't know. I'm not prepared the whittle on that end of the stick this morning. But what I can tell you from Scripture is that the proper use 
that you and I need to make of the calamities that we suffer in life is to get us to examine our lives and get them right with God. The year 2020 has not been a routine, normal year. There's been a lot of things out of the ordinary happening. There's been a lot of suffering going on. As soon as these church buildings are open, they ought to be full. People ought to realize that there is a God in heaven and that they're accountable to him. Yet, will they be? Will we listen to the warnings that are given, uh, not just through Scripture, but through the things we experience in our lives today. That's, that's one thing I see from this text. Something else that I see as we look at chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, is that man is no match for God. When Amos says, therefore, that is because you've not heeded the warning, because you've not returned to me, Therefore, verse 12, thus I will do to you, Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. Now this announcement, prepare to meet your God, was not a pleasant thing. It wasn't Amos saying, you know what? God has decided to come and visit you and it's going to be a great honor for you and you need to get everything ready. It's going to be great. This was a call to war. God was saying, I'm coming for you. I'm coming to punish you. Prepare to meet your God. Israel was woefully undermatched and unprepared. Look at verse 13. Here's the God that was coming for them. Here's the God that they needed to prepare to meet. For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind, who declares to man what his thought is and makes the morning darkness, who treads the high places of the earth, the Lord God of hosts is his name. There's a lot about God packed into this one verse. For starters, we see what is called the omnipotence of God. That is the almighty power of God. And this is seen in his creation and his control of this physical world around about us. Notice, he who forms the mountains and creates the wind. As we look at this world and we look at the, the laws of God that control this world and allow this world to operate, we are in awe of the power of our God. Secondly is what could be called the omniscience of God or the fact that God knows everything. And this is related to us in the phrase in verse 13, who declares to man what his thought is. Not only does God know what we've done, he knows what we're doing. And not only does God know what we're doing, this text says he knows what we're thinking about doing. He knows the thoughts of our heart before we can express them as words. God knows everything. And a third thing about God is what is called his omnipresence, or the fact that God is everywhere all the time. It says, who treads the high places of the earth. God is above all. He is over all. From his vantage point, he can see it all. He is everywhere. There's no place that you and I can go to hide from this God. Now, prepare to meet thy God. This is the God who is coming. Are you and I ready to prepare, ready to meet him? Are we prepared? What are we going to bring to this battle? to try to be victorious, to try to overpower God? What weapons are we going to use? What weapons do we have at our disposal to try to match and meet this God? What war plans can we implement? It doesn't matter what we come up with. God knows beforehand. What words can we use to try to argue our case before God, to try to win before God? Here's the thing. When Amos says, prepare to meet your God, what Amos is really saying is, prepare to be destroyed. Because there was no, they were no match for God. There was no way they could stand before 
God. But as I go into chapter 5, I see that that's not the end of the matter. All is not lost. There is still hope. There is a call for Israel to repent. God calls man to repent. That is what we see at the beginning of chapter 5 here. Instead of opposing the Lord, they need to seek the Lord and live. Sin and rebellion will always bring God's judgment and wrath. But repentance will always bring deliverance from God's wrath. A common theme in all of the prophets is repentance. Again, if you're not familiar with this portion of Scripture, that, that's a common theme. God was using the prophets to call his people to repentance. And to repent means to turn. Repentance calls for an action. That The command to repent calls for an action from you and I, not an emotion. Repentance is not feeling sorry, feeling bad because we got caught or feeling sorry because we've, we've hurt someone's feelings or we've upset God. No, repentance is a command. That means that it requires an action on our part. And literally, the word repent means to turn. And the Israelites, they had a lot of sins that they needed to turn away from. Look here in chapter 5, uh, verses 4 and 5. For thus says the Lord God to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. But do not seek Bethel, nor enter Gilgal, nor pass over to Beersheba. For Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to nothing. Scholars tell us that Bethel, Gilgal, and Beersheba were centers of idol worship in the northern kingdom. Don't turn to idols. Don't go to idols. Idolatry was one of the sins that they needed to repent of, but it wasn't the only one. Look at verse 7. You who turn justice into wormwood. Wormwood is bitterness. You who make justice bitter for the people who need it. You who lay righteousness to rest in the earth. That is, you kill it and you bury it so that it isn't around any longer. What, what, is, what is their sin here? Injustice. Those who were in power were perverting justice in order to line their pockets. You look down in verse 10. They hate the one who rebukes in the gate and they abhor the one who speaks rightly. They didn't appreciate the truth. They resisted God's way and God's truth. That happens today, doesn't it? Oh, that's hate speech. You can't say that, we'll sue you. Look at verse 11. Therefore, because you tread down the poor and take grain taxes from him, though you have built houses of hewn stone, what were they doing here? They were abusing the poor. They were making themselves rich by abusing those who were defenseless, those who were poor. Verse 12, For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins, afflicting the just and taking bribes, diverting the poor from justice at the gate. Political and judicial corruption. This reads like a modern-day newspaper, doesn't it? You know, one of the things that makes the prophets uh, so attractive to many Bible students today is because the sins of the people are so relevant. The things that Israel was doing in those days, we see happening in our own nation today. And we, we hear the prophet cry out against it, bringing God's judgment and righteous standard against it, and we say amen to that. They were guilty of these sins, they must repent of these sins. They must turn away from these sins. But turning away from sin is not all that repentance requires. That's only half of the process. It's not enough just to turn away from sin. There are three times in this passage, this reading, that Amos calls upon them to turn towards something and to seek something. Verse 4, seek me and live. Verse 6, seek, seek the Lord and live. Verse 14, seek good and not evil that you may live. That word seek has to do with the direction of our life. 
It, again, calls for action. Yes, we need to turn away from sin. We need to put that behind us. But we don't need to stop there. To truly, fully repent, we need to seek God. We need to seek the ways of God. We need to seek God on His terms, not on ours. We need to seek good and not evil. We don't need to be indifferent about evil. We need to hate evil and turn away from it. And we need to seek God good and strive for it and to insist that good is upheld around about us. And if we do these things, notice God says through the prophet, you'll live. Seek me and live. The problem is that Israel was seeking everything but God. And so many people around us today, they're seeking pleasure and privilege and popularity and power, prosperity, they're seeking everything but God. God calls for us to repent. And repentance involves turning away from sin and turning towards God and actively seeking after God. There's a fourth thing that I see that I want to show you here in chapter 5. That is the danger of false confidence, the danger of false assurance. Look with me at verses 18 through 20. 18 through 20. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Or as though he went into the house, leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. I want us to look at, at these two verses here, just 18 and 19. There's a lot packed in here. The first word is the word woe. It is a word that is used that, that refers to the doom that one is about to suffer the judgment and the destruction that is coming upon them, woe to you for what is about to happen to you. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. That phrase there, the day of the Lord, is common among the prophets. And as it's used in the prophets, it refers to a, a, a time, a day, that they would look forward to and anticipate with hope and with joy. It's a time when God would intervene and deliver them from their enemies and would bring about peace and would bring about prosperity. It was something that was longed for. It was something that was welcomed by God's people. But because they were blinded to their true spiritual condition, they weren't prepared for the Lord to come because the Lord wasn't coming to punish the sin of their enemies. The Lord, if the day of the Lord came, he was coming to punish their sins. And they didn't see that they had sin. They didn't see that they had any problem with God. But judgment day for them, that is, the day of the Lord for them, would not be what they expected. Again, woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Boy, I wish the Lord would come right now. I wish judgment would come right now. Then everything would be made well. For what good is the day of the Lord for you? It will be darkness and not light. When I read this passage and I think about that the blindness of these Israelites as they were, they had this false sense of confidence and security before the Lord. I can't help but think of the Lord's teaching himself in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, as he gives us that picture of judgment day to come. Matthew chapter 7 Verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of our, my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. 
Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I want you to notice what we have a picture of here is some people who have a false sense of confidence before the Lord. They're calling him Lord. They're serving him. They've got all these things that they've been doing. They are entering into judgment, confident that they're God's people, but they're blind to their true spiritual condition. They never were the people of God. He does not recognize them as his people, and this day is not a day of victory for them. It's a day of devastation for them. The day of the Lord for us is going to be the second coming of Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 tells us that this day will bring both rest and wrath. It all depends on who we are. But the Lord will bring with him rest and he will bring wrath. And I want you to turn to this passage and see who gets what. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let's read verses 6 through 10. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Notice he's going to bring tribulation. He's going to bring rest. Who's going to get the tribulation? Look at verse 8 in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe God? If not, the, the day of judgment will be a day of tribulation for you. You're not prepared to meet your God. Have you obeyed the gospel? Maybe you believe in God, but, but have you turned your attention to the gospel of Jesus Christ to see what it requires of you? Have you obeyed the gospel? If you haven't, you're not prepared to meet your God. Judgment day will not be a day of victory for you. It will not be a day of rest for you. It will be a day of tribulation, a day of wrath. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified with his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. He will come and he will come in judgment against those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel. Have you obeyed the gospel? If not, you're not prepared. And if you're a Christian and you're thinking, you know what, this day is not anything I need to be concerned about, you turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, and let's look at verses 17 and 18. 1 Peter Chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Oh, I'm a Christian. Oh, I'm in the church. I'm okay. Judgment starts there. Are you sure you're prepared to meet your God? It's a serious matter. Israel, they were God's people. And God was coming for them. Judgment will begin with the house of God. And God is not appeased by us giving him worship. God is not appeased by us going to a house of worship every week and thinking that that takes care and that atones for whatever it is that we've done the rest of the time. Going back to Amos chapter 5. Going back to Amos chapter 5, again, God has, has told them of their sin. He's told them to seek him and to seek good. He's told them that the day of the Lord will not be what they think. It will not be light for them. It will be darkness to them. He says in verse 19, it would be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. And this is another reason we like the prophets is because they bring in these illustrations that, you know, in other circumstances would be humorous. Just imagine running from a lion 
and you turn the corner and you run right smack into a bear. You haven't escaped. Or perhaps you ran from that lion and, and you ran from that bear and you got into your house and you shut the door of your house and you're safe and you lean your hand against the wall to rest and a poisonous snake bites you and you drop dead in your house. The point God is making here is you won't escape. You will not escape. Now you go down just verse 21 here. I hate, I despise your feast days. I do not save your sacred assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fatted peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I do not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. Now God was not accepting their worship. Here's the thing. They felt that as long as they were giving some kind of semblance to God, some kind of service to him, that he was okay with them. He wasn't. No, God knew he did not have their heart. And they were not living right before him. And no amount of worship is going to buy off the Lord. And that's just as true today as it ever has been. Now, I look forward to the time when we can get back into our assemblies. We can get back and we can worship God together. But that will never take the place of seeking the Lord and seeking good and not evil. There's a lot packed into this book of Amos and a lot packed into just these two chapters that we've looked at right here. All wrapped around the, the, the warning, prepare to meet God your God. This may have been written to an apostate nation centuries ago, but don't you see that the lessons are relevant and much needed today? God warns us. God is faithful to warn us in his word and, and the things that we suffer in life. They need to be turning us to God, not against God. We are no match for God. We're no match for him. He's powerful. He's all-knowing. He's ever-present. We're no match for him. What we need to do is repent. That's the only way that we can be prepared is to repent. And to repent is more than just saying that we're sorry we got caught. To repent requires us to turn away from sin and to seek God and his way with all of our heart. And there is danger in self-confidence. That is, false confidence. It is always best for us to stop and examine our spiritual lives honestly in light of the Scripture and strive to see ourselves the way God really sees us. And if there's anything lacking at all, we need to make that right. So I ask you, are you prepared to meet your God. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, you must do so. You must confess that Jesus is the Son of God. You must repent of your sins, and you must be baptized in water to have your sins washed away. If you would like to know more about obeying the gospel and becoming a Christian, would you message me? I'm not hard to get a hold of, I would love to talk with you more about this matter. If you are a Christian and your life is not right with God, you need to get it right, and you know you do. You need to repent of your sin, and you need to make things right with your God. Until you do, you're not prepared for the one thing that you know for certain is going to happen. You are going to meet your God one day. I thank you for following along with me and having your Bible out. I hope and pray you'll go back over and read these chapters and see that the things we've talked about are the truth. And if you find them to be the truth, that you will make the application to your heart and to your life. Lord willing, we'll be back here on Wednesday night, hopefully uh, without any technical problems. And uh, we will look forward to, to seeing you then. And we'll be studying uh, from Philippians chapter 2 and wrapping up that study. Until then, would you be a light to those around about you? Would you let your light shine? 
so that others can see that there is a God, there is a Savior, there is hope in this world. You can show people that. Let's let our light shine. Thank you very much for being with us this morning.